Good afternoon and welcome to Midday Live from our news hub here at Adesawe in Kanda. I am Aisha Yakubu. Coming up in the headlines this afternoon. Sunyani Nursing and Midwifery Training College in dire need of support. And on the international front, Brexit cross-party talks at delicate stage, says British Senior Cabinet Minister David Liddington. We have details of these and many other stories coming up in the next one hour. To our very first story, sheds serving as classrooms for pupils of Kwatepet Community School in the Pandai district of the northern region have collapsed. Stanley Niblo reports pupils steady under harsh conditions. <laughs> Just as their marching song suggests, these pupils have been marching for Mother Ghana with the hope of changing society with education. But the building that accommodates them has been blown down by rainstorm. This happened at a time when school was not in session. No casualty was recorded. The Parent Teacher Association has provided two sheds. Classes 1 and 2 have occupied one class, while class 3 pupils are also under the other shed. The structure is weak, so we let the community establish this one. In case when it broke down, we can sit under this one. A mango tree serves kindergarten 1 and 2 pupils, and here, academic works are carried out on the floor. When you are teaching them, they, when the mango is on top, they are looking for the mango to block it down. So they are not concentrating on the learning. Two other helping teachers have abandoned the classroom for farming, a situation they attributed to parents not paying the three-seat terminal fee. The Kwatape Community School has, however, received support from two benefactors after TV3 Mission told their worrying story. One donated stationery, while the other philanthropist donated desk. So far, what they have done, we are grateful, simply because formerly class, it was class three alone that is having chairs. Now the class two is having chair, class one is having chair. It's led with only the KG1 and KG2. The school is not the only learning institution in the Tenglento electoral area, but for proximity's sake, it is the preferred choice for many. Promotion of quality education and lifelong learning for all is enshrined in the fourth goal of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which is attainable by 2030. For the Kwatape Community School to achieve the set goal on education, teachers want Ghana Education Service to adopt the school. Stanley Nibleu, TV3 News, Kwatape, Pandai, Northern region. Now, the Asante Hini Otumfo said to the second has emphasized the need for more aggressive push towards girls' education in the country. Addressing Queen Mothers at the Minsha Palace, the Asante Hini said it is important to collectively join efforts at making the school environment friendly for girls. The Hini Otunfo Seitu II instituted a day to specially celebrate women as part of his 20th anniversary commemoration. The Queen Mother's Day brought together queens and other women leaders, including the Chief of Staff, Akosia Frema Sewa Opare, and wife of Asante Hini, Lady Julia Oseitu II. The Asante Hini Otunfo Seitu II lauded the role of women in Ghana's development. He believes women empowerment through education would significantly help fight poverty, reduce teenage pregnancy, and quicken the pace of national development. Chief of 
Chief of Staff Akosia Fremosa Opari reiterated government's commitment to partner with traditional and religious leaders to attain the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. <laughs> Wife of the Asante Hene, Lady Julia Osetutu advocated the empowerment of women for social transformation. Karen Sisters Vocational Training Institute at Tegbi in the Keta municipality of the Votal region lacks adequate infrastructure, training materials and staff. Peter Kwawadato reports the school's enrollment has declined coupled with poor performance. The Karen Sisters Vocational Training Institute was established in 1990 in response to technical and vocational skills need. Almost three decades after its establishment, the institute lacks the needed facilities that will make it meet its stated goals. The institute does not have adequate infrastructure, and even the few available are in poor state. Teaching and learning materials are also non-existent. The institution relies mainly on old and obsolete materials to teach, leading to ineffective service delivery. The entire school has only three functional computers with an ICT laboratory. The current student's population stands at 53, comprising 51 females and two males. This manager of the institute, Christian Isi Nenevi, blamed on insufficient classrooms and teaching materials. The institute is facing challenges such as inadequate modern equipment for training. Postal facilities, we don't have any and also lack of staff. Currently, the institute offers only two courses, catering and fashion designing. Christian Esi Nenevi called for government intervention. By providing us with hostel facilities that can accommodate students that will come from far away and also give us classroom facilities that will help us improve enrollment. Executive Director of the National Vocational Training Institute, Mausi Nudeko Awiti, announced plans to construct a four-story classroom block, student hostel and an ICT block for the institute. The investors are already in and everything, your dormitory you talked about, they are going to build next year when we meet. They are going to meet in this structure. Beautiful structure. Other speakers urged parents and the youth to consider vocational and technical education a priority for their personal well-being and national development. In some more stories, two educationists have admitted, although the revision of the KG to primary curriculum is a step in the right direction, it is important the country's education system takes advantage of technology. The two, Anis Hafer and Professor Reginald Okante, both stressed the need for assessment to see the extent to which the content has been covered. Here's a report by Wendy Lai. As global trends evolve, countries are burdened to quickly catch up to ensure their educational systems quickly adapt. It is a step in the right direction in a sense that we've recognized all the various aspects of education that we have to hone in. I think we are in the right direction with the current renovations, I would say, to the old curriculum. For Nis Hafa, the educationist, there's need to focus on technology and digital influence. Technological advancements uh, are making it much easier, one, to learn. Uh, they are making it much easier to teach. And they are making it much easier to learn skills, you know. So the most important thing now is how we begin to incorporate technology into the way we do things. He explained three key elements that remain a challenge for every educational system in the world. What can you do with the skills that you, uh, you've you been able to acquire at the, uh, all the way through university or even secondary education that will help you to produce something? That's number one. And the second is this. What is the service that one can provide to make someone's life a bit easier, you know? And uh, the last one being, what are the solutions to a societal problem, considering all the education that you're getting? 
A head of department at the University of Ghana School of Education and Leadership, Professor Reginald Okansi, noted curriculum is dynamic, calling for regular reviews. Teachers, administrators, to make sure that curriculum is revised as often as possible. In fact, if we can monitor on a daily basis how students work their way through the various objectives, at the end of the term, we will be able to have some narrative of students' interaction with the content. And teachers will also be able to know how well they have done in the introduction and engagement of students with the content. If we don't do so, then we're going to wait for another 20 years before we come up with uh, a revision of a curriculum, which is not good. He touched on best ways of implementing the curriculum. Whether the content equates the available time for instruction is another matter. So we can have a very good written curriculum, but if the content outweighs the time, we are not going to be yielding the benefits the curriculum is built for. Teachers will be teaching and they will not be able to finish the syllabus before the end of the school year. And so students will be half-baked before they go in for the final exams. They both underscored the need for teachers to be properly trained, among other things, to make implementation a success. For those who are being trained now to carry on these uh, curriculum renovations that we're talking about, where the, uh, the teachers, the uh, student teachers are taught at the school sites, it's very, very important. We tend to train teachers in the lecture halls. But that's not enough. If you want to look at what we call pedagogy, uh, the ability to get into someone else, the ability to understand the environment in which young people work, the ability to be able to develop teaching and learning materials and look at your own situation and assess what it is. It, these things are not done in lecture halls. They have to be done at school sites. Uh, with a new B.Ed., uh, Bachelor of Education in Basic Education, now. This is the content for the, for the basic schools is the, um, the specialty content that teachers in training will have to learn. So student teachers in the colleges of education should be very familiar and be able to execute the content when they come out. Now, over 500 students have been displaced at Asakore T.I. Amadea Girls Senior High School in the Setra East District after a rainstorm in the Ashanti region. Some students were hit, were hit by flying objects during the storm and were sent to the hospital for treatment. About 27 of the students received medical attention. Six of them who were injured were taken to the emergency wards of the Sokari Hamadiya Mission Hospital and the Efidiasi Government Hospital. School prefect Fatima Batutu appealed to stakeholders to come to their aid. As of now, there are three members. They had to go to the Khalifa Hall and some had to sleep in their classes. Now, you know, we are in the rainy season and any red red towels are. The rainstorm caused havoc to property, including vehicles parked on campus. Electric poles fell, while trees were uprooted. The headmistress of the school, Hachia Ashetubwachi, called for support to complete the abandoned get fan dormitory block on campus. As they are about to write their final exams. They need a place to sleep. They have to study through. I need their help. The rainstorm also hit other schools within the Setra East District. David Opon is the Setra East District Director of Education. We are going to the site to do a proper analysis of the situation. Later on, we need to give you feedback. Over 250 students were also rendered homeless after a downpour. The district chief executive, Mary Boatima Malfo, said the assembly will assess the damage caused to both public and private property. 
Now, the Sunyani Nursing and Midwifery Training College is using internally generated funds to address some infrastructural and security challenges in the college. Principal of the college, David Amaliba Ain, says this is to ensure a safe environment for students to pursue their academic work. Students of the college have in the past suffered from robbery attacks at night and robbed of their possessions like laptops, mobile phones and money. Some of the students have also suffered from sexual attacks by miscreants. To help advert the growing insecurity threat, management allocated funds from its internal sources to construct a secured fence wall and a firm gate. The principal of the college, David Amaliba, said they have mobilized enough funds to construct a hostel. The problem is that we have our own uh, security men. Then we also have the private security, but still they are not able to track these uh, thieves. Community members in Sa in the Kasnan and Kana West District of the Upper East Region have reconstructed portions of their only Marchips compound in the area. Tanko Mohamed Rabi reports the facility serves a population of about 2,000 people. The determination of residents in Sa, a community in the Kasinanankana West District, to bring health care close to them saw the construction of a mud chips compound in 2012. The construction was also to reduce long distance travel to health centers in Chiana and Paga. The facility after construction greatly helped to reduce maternal mortality. But years after the facility was put up, some portions have fallen apart. This led residents in the community to mobilize themselves to construct the fallen portions of a facility. The CHIPS compound is faced with challenges including lack of electricity, lack of toilet facilities, and a means of transport for referrals. The facility receives about 80 patients daily, with majority being pregnant and nursing mothers. About 40% of the patients are referred to either the health center at Chiana or the district capital in Paga, depending on the case. Bazumi Elisha is the only community nurse in the Sa Chips compound. We don't have emergency transport, which is making it very difficult for the women here, especially night time. A pregnant woman who is due for labor. There is no resident for me staying here, and I rent outside the community. So sometimes I'll be in the house midnight, and they'll call me that there's a labor case, which is very, very disturbing. Chairman of the SA Health Committee, Afani Daniel, appealed to government to put up a befitting chips compound for the community. We're expecting the government so that it will come and help us with maybe a something small. But wait till now, we didn't get any help. And it was 2017 that because of the heavy rains, it fell. And now it just brought some challenges to the community. Away from that, the Ghana Police Service is to take delivery of three helicopters this year to enhance its operational capabilities. Chief of Staff Akosia Fremal Seopare told the 2018 CID Wasa in Accra, work is also in progress to equip the Detective Training Academy to world standard. Meanwhile, TV3's Peter Kwawadato and four other journalists were honored for their selfless and dedication to public CID. Technological advancement and increasing globalization have facilitated international trade and business. Unfortunately, criminals have leveraged these opportunities to advance their illegal activities. Criminals use sophisticated methods to commit crimes. This means relying solely on traditional approach and methods of investigation and crime fighting are no longer sufficient to fight against crimes. It is against this backdrop that government over the years continue to empower and root to the Ghana Police Service to deal with modern day crimes. Crimes such as robbery, kidnapping, murder, and most recently vigilantism are threatening the peace and stability of this country. 
for the first time in the history of this country, the Ghana Police Service will take delivery of three helicopters to enhance its operational capabilities. Chief of Staff Akusia Fremao Sayopare also announced ongoing plans to rebuild the capacity of investigators. A new modern national detective training academy which will have facilities that will equal any training facility for detectives in the world is being put up at Kenya State number one in the Brown region. She urged the police service to act with dispatch in their duties. The 2018 CID WASA was on the theme Consolidating Ideas Against Vigilantism for National Safety. Best personnel from all the 34 units under the Criminal Investigation Department were honored for their exceptional roles in 2018. The event also honored TV3's Peter Kwawadato and four other journalists from Daily Guide, The Ghanaian Times, Graphic Communications Group, and City News for their selfless service and dedication to the police CID. Congratulations to Peter Kwadato and the other journalists as well. The Nkranza South Municipal Assembly and the Pru East District Assembly have disbursed their share of the Assembly Common Fund to persons with disability at separate events. Head of the two assemblies warns against submission of ghost names, warning persons found culpable would be dealt with. The Inkwansa Municipal Assembly set aside 121,000 cities for disbursement to 300 registered persons with disabilities. Based on individual peculiar need, some were supplied with electrical appliances while others received checks. Inkwansa Municipal Chief Executive Daina Atakusiwa advise beneficiaries to use the money judiciously. I'm pleading that they should make use of the items that we've given them so that their family will also benefit. One of the beneficiaries, Nuhu Osman, called for an increase in the amount disbursed. A similar event took place at GG in the Peru East District where 27,000 cities was disbursed to 67 beneficiaries. The Peru District Chief Executive, Joshua Kweku Abonkra, advised beneficiaries to make use of the money they had received. We will make a follow-up. Wherever they are going to place them in working, we will make sure that they will uh, find a proper means of using it. And the portion is that they should use it judiciously in order to... Three-year-old Godwin Kofi Kwache requires urgent financial support to undergo surgery to correct a hole in heart defect. Now his unemployed father says he cannot afford the 27,000 CDs medical bill by the cardiothoracic center at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital and is appealing for support to save the life of his only child. Godwin, who resides in Obuasi with his father, is cheerful and plays like any child of his age. Behind his bubbly life is a life-threatening heart condition which requires urgent surgery. His father, Edward Asari, says his son's abnormal breath was detected when he was about four months old. Doctors at the Comfort Nochi Teaching Hospital later diagnosed a hole in heart condition. But his father says he cannot afford the cost of surgery. It saddens my heart when I see him struggle at night because his breath is abnormal, but he looks normal during the day. Edward Asari says he spends 100 cities monthly on medication to ensure his son's condition does not relapse. Every month, I spend 100 cities on his medication every month, something I can no longer afford. Little Godwin needs 27,000 cities to undergo the corrective procedure. You're watching Midday Live from our news hub here at Adesawi. We're going for a short break. When we return, we have more stories for you. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us here on Midday Live. Let's do some more stories. And the Forestry Commission has inaugurated a charcoal chamber of commerce of Ghana. The innovation is to help steer, regulate, and coordinate affairs of the local charcoal industry. Here's a report by Peter Kawadato. 
Wood fuels account for more than 60% of total energy used in Ghana. The annual consumption rate of wood for energy was 16 million tons between 2000 and 2004. More than 90% of Ghana's rural population depend on wood energy for firewood or charcoal. However, the nature of the charcoal value chain in the country is unsustainable. This is because tree harvesting, production, bulk storage, wholesale, transportation and retailing are poorly managed, unregulated and unprotected. The absence of a framework to promote the recognition, regularization and transformation of the charcoal industry appears to be worsening matters. The relatively high level of dependence of Ghana on charcoal places and obligations on the country to ensure regulation and sustainable management of the charcoal value chain. This is imperative for helping to sustain its enormous contribution to the socio-economic development of the country without necessarily compromising on environmental quality. With cutting down of trees without replacement, contributing to climate change, the establishment of a chamber has become crucial for the industry to survive. We've been confronted by a number of challenges. Lack of sustainable funding for operations. Ignorance of most of our members about the rules and regulations of the charcoal industry. Our newly formed organization has a very strong motivation to mitigate our seemingly uncontrollable challenges. Deputy CEO of the Forestry Commission, John Aluti, urged members not to let it be a city-based announcement of intent. To be able to lead the way in charcoal and production, both for domestic use and then export. The current trend posed by the indiscriminate harvesting of trees for charcoal production is not a threat only to the environment, but it's also a threat to their own livelihoods. Stakeholders in waste management are proposing a military intervention in the fight against poor waste management in the country. They argue that the posture of Ghanaian stores' best waste management practice requires stringent measures to produce any desired result. For Ado promised to make Accra the cleanest city in Africa in four years. My pledge of improving sanitation in the country and making Accra the cleanest city in Africa by the end of my term. This pronouncement was later extended to be a call for nationwide cleanliness. The state of sanitation in our cities is wholly unacceptable. Our cities have been engulfed by filth. There's the urgent need for public authorities to find means of making our cities clean. But nearly two and a half years into his administration, not much has changed. Accra and other parts have remained filthy. Industry players blamed it on government's continuous lip service to critical national issues. They contended there are enough sanitation bylaws that when evoked and strictly applied could change the face of the country. Chief Executive Officer of Asadu Royal Waste Management, Edward Asadu, noted introducing the National Service Model on Sanitation will help change the dynamics. Engaging the teeming jobless graduates in waste management will help a great deal in making the cities and the country clean. This will also improve the economy. He again called for the amendment of the existing sanitation bylaws to merit current situations. We cannot rely on over 50-year-old laws and regulations and expect to achieve the desired results. Even the police are struggling to prosecute with those outmoded laws. We urgently need to amend our laws on sanitation to reflect current trends as well as becoming punitive enough to deter repeat offenders. Director of Public Relations at the Ghana First Company Limited, Charles Amwa, wants the involvement of the military to deter the indiscriminate dumping of waste. We are not saying that the army should come and beat people, but their presence, their presence alone on the streets, their visibility in itself will be a deterrent to the ordinary man on the street. And therefore, people will not even trash around. Charles Amwa encouraged the public to change the mindset towards waste management to spare accelerated growth. 
In some other stories, the Deputy Interior Minister Henry Corte says the Ghana Immigration Service is well equipped to fight against transnational organized crimes such as drug trafficking, money laundering and smuggling of persons. He made this known at the inauguration of the training facility within the Documents Fraud and Expertise Center here in Accra. Ghana in 2010 opened a document fraud detection center touted as a novelty in sub-Saharan Africa. The 147,000 euro document fraud expertise center is the focal point for the fight on document fraud in the country. Deputy Interior Minister Henry Quarte at the inauguration of a training facility within the document fraud expertise center said effective border security which ensures good profiling and document fraud identification can reduce the threat of insecurity. It is worth mentioning that Ghana Immigration Service has a very special and crucial role to play in securing our borders, maintaining the country's territorial integrity and ensuring our economic well-being. Comptroller General of Immigration Kwame Esua Techi was hopeful the facility would enhance the capacity of personnel of the service. Training is one of the key mandates of the center. DFEC over this period has contributed immensely in the capacity building of GIS personnel, stakeholders, including other partners in the West African sub region. The building of this facility by the Federal Police of Germany has come at the right time as it will boost the capacity of the center in conducting further training for all concerned. German Ambassador to Ghana, Krzysztof Retzlaff, said security is the basis for every development. And we are doing this because we see challenges, of course, in the field of peace and security um, in the region of West Africa. And this center, the capacity building for the Ghana Immigration Service, is of course meant um, to fight trans cross-border international and transporter crime uh, in all forms. The training facility was sponsored by the Federal Police of Germany. Now, the Ghana Innovation and Research Commercialization Center is expected to commence operation in September this year. The center will help harmonize the findings of various studies conducted by scientists and researchers. Ghana Innovation and Research Commercialization Center under the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation will provide a facility that will help researchers and manufacturers to work together. It will also help in the translation of research findings and other innovations into products and service for commercialization. If we have a research product, we can guide you to, from research transition from research to a product uh, so that the researcher doesn't have to go around looking for investors and then the investors too will have a place where they can come and ha get information about what where they want to invest the center among other things is to coordinate both private and public research in the country we want to put together this institution so that at every point we'll know which research is going on in which institution and at what point and whether that research is something that has uh, potential of transitioning to a product so that at the end of the year or a period we'll know the research that was going on the new products that came out and the new companies that came out of those research facilities and then we can then at some point say that um, because of this research uh, certain things have been done and it has contributed to uh, a GDP growth, contributed to employment creation. Technology manager for design and build at Managing Technology Center in the United Kingdom, Dr. Lucy Japon, was of the view that it must be a cutting edge technology center in bringing out product and services. Go to place for proving our technology and taking it to the next level. So let's use as an example, and someone comes up with a great idea and they don't know how can I make it. They can come to the center and they'll have the best skills, best knowledge, best tools, equipment to be able to prove out this technology, actually come up with a tangible project, product and then test it on the market and see if that will actually work. And then they take it from there and develop it from there. 
Chief Executive Officer of Magdan Group of Companies, Dr. Daniel Macaulay, has added his voice to the call to graduates to consider entrepreneurship. He insisted graduate unemployment will continue if graduates do not change the orientation on aspiring to work in the public sector. The Ghana Labor Force Survey report by the Ghana Statistical Service in 2017 pegged the unemployment rate at 11.9% in 2015, a rise of about 6% since 2012 and 2013. According to the Institute of Statistics, Social and Economic Research of the University of Ghana, only 10% of graduates find jobs after their first year of completing school, with a larger number of them securing employment after 10 years. This is due to varied challenges that range from the lack of employable skills, unavailability of funding capital for entrepreneurship, poor attitudes of graduates towards job opportunities, as well as the low capacities of industry to absorb the huge numbers. The data contradicts Goal 8 of the Sustainable Development Goals, which seeks to ensure that countries promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth, employment and decent work for its citizens. Speaking at an entrepreneurship seminar by the Department of Development Education Studies of the University of Development Studies in Tamale, Dr. Macaulay said attitude and consistency are key in entrepreneurship. If you want to be very successful in life, what makes a difference is your attitude. 70% is the attitude you acquire in your progression in life. That's what makes you successful. 25% is skill, 5% is knowledge. Recounting his personal challenges as an entrepreneur, he urged universities to make frantic efforts to provide practical training for students. Can you imagine that you are running a hundred million dollar business and you go to class, you subject yourself to lectures, you don't even understand what they are teaching you. I remember one of the courses was a business strategies. And after writing about four pages, when the results came, I got in C. And that was one of the best subjects I feel we have to understand as young entrepreneurs. He charged government to increase its innovative policies to absorb practicable business ideas. Our budget this year is 78 billion Ghana city, a small country like ours. Where we use, I think, about 22 billion to service low. And we are not pride of having a single billionaire in Ghana. It saddens my heart. I couldn't get any of the Ghanaian companies who stand tall. Magdal is still struggling, Kasapa is still struggling. Just mention any other company that you can think of as a Ghanaian story. We are all struggling. Dean of the Faculty of Education of UDS, Dr. Adams Achanso, said the university as part of its measures to empower graduates turned out has introduced the Entrepreneurship for Development course. The Great War has come. The war has fallen and the Night King's army of the dead marches towards Westeros. Now the end is near. But who will take the Iron Throne as the eighth and final season of HBO's fantasy drama television series Game of Thrones scheduled to premiere today comes to a close. Naftali Ba explores, explores how the saga of ice and fire will ultimately come to a close. George R. R. Martin's best-selling book series, A Song of Ice and Fire, is brought to the screen by HBO. It depicts two powerful families, kings and queens, liars and honest men, all playing a deadly game for control of the seven kingdoms of Westeros and to sit on the Iron Throne. We will defeat it. We're the last Lannisters. The last ones you count. 
for seven seasons, you have watched characters lie, bleed, and sacrifice for the Iron Throne. A season 8 trailer opens with the terrified Aya sprinting away from an unknown enemy through Winterfell Corridor. The scene then casts what seemed to be an earlier shot of her holding a dagger made of dragon glass, one of the two materials that can kill white walkers and whites. The eighth and final season of Game of Thrones is just hours away and fans are eager to find out how the saga of ice and fire will ultimately come to a close. It is probably not much of a spoiler to say the humans in Game of Thrones will soon do battle with the White Walkers because that's what has been building all series long. However, what is even more interesting is the fact that the set battle is expected to take place at Winterfell where the wall has fallen and white walkers are running past the wall led by Jaqen and his dragon. He's coming for us. For all of us. One army, a real army, united behind one leader with one purpose. We'll be rolling over a graveyard if we don't defeat the Night King. As the final season approaches, how will the Night King and his army of White Walkers be defeated? And who sits on the Iron Throne? Fingers are crossed. And then it doesn't matter whose skeleton sits on the Iron Throne. I know fans of Game of Thrones are on the edge of their seats, but that's how we end news this afternoon here on Midday Live. There's more news on our website. It is 3news.com. Thanks so much for your company. My name is Aisha Yakubu. Have a good afternoon.